a lot of rumination happens for me in that. I grew up on a highway outside of a town. Like, I didn't even have neighbors as a kid, so that's just like my natural state, I guess. Um, but in all honesty, I didn't set out to make a movie about AI. What, I, what attracted me to this, besides working with Jen and Simu and Sterling, who couldn't be here today, um, was the theme of trust. I, I believe most of our meaningful relationships in our lives are built on respect and trust. And I think you can earn someone's respect relatively easily, but trust is something that I've found difficult to earn with people and also to have them earn from me. And so I was fascinated with this idea of this woman who just didn't trust. And for, for valid reasons, she has a childhood trauma she has to overcome. But that's what pulled me in. The complexity of it, uh, the, the fact that she had been sort of you know, abused by this AI and then was stuck in a machine that was run by AI. The irony of that made me smile when I read the concept. I was like, oh, that's really neat. And as a genre fan, and you can go all the way back to like James Whale in the, in the 1920s or like Creature from the Black Lagoon or King Kong. These are all genre films that are talking about things that were faux pas. You weren't allowed to talk about interrelation, inter interracial relationships. You weren't allowed to have those conversations. So for me, using genre to dress up a movie about something that's like very hot, heartfelt, very human, like our ability to trust and what we have to go through to trust, that's what I think makes great genre. So I can have explosions and I can have alien ships and I can have giant mech suits, but there's a super, super human element and theme in the movie, and, and that's really what pulled me in. Well, I'm winded or whatever. So, we have a question from Nueva Mujer, Karen Hernandez. She's right here, I think. And um, the question is for Jennifer Lopez. This film blends science fiction and action with a deep emotional core. How do you tap into Atlas emotions and motivations to bring her character to life? I mean, it's just like with anything when you're approaching it as, a, as an actress, you know, you try to find the similarities to things that you have you know, gone through in your own life, but also kind of your imagination, especially in a movie like this where there's tons of green screen, your imagination has to kind of run wild. Um, and that's a big part of being an actor. And I think with Atlas, there was parts of her that um, were very similar to me. She's driven, she's strong, she's focused, she's passionate. And then there was parts of her that were very different from me. I wear my heart on my sleeve, and she was very closed off and didn't want to let anybody in. And um, it was just, for me, preparing for that and doing that, it was something that was very easy for me to kind of draw from my own life, in a way. Um, different relationships and different things that I've been through, for sure. One of the things, too, that I've mentioned to people, like, you have a lot of great virtues, but courage is probably the one that stood out for me in the sense that, like, you were put inside of a mech suit by yourself for like six or seven weeks, and a lot of actors or actresses would not be comfortable in that situation. But because you go out in front of stadiums of people as the lead, it sort of like prepared you for a role like that, where you could just step out there and be like, okay, I can, I can do yeah, this. Yeah, it's like being, it was like being on stage and doing a one-woman show for six or seven weeks. <laughs> it, was, it was a strange experience. I think a lot of actors would tell you that, that you know, doing that kind of role where you're by yourself and having to imagine all that stuff is, is a challenging thing. It actually has to do with the next question from El Comercio, Peru, Carla Magdalena of Caña Ojeda. She, she's asking you, Jennifer, how challenging was it to perform in scenes where you were the sole visible character interacting only with the AI? Yeah, I, I remember like he, somebody was saying that Jodie Foster, when she did Contact, said that that was the hardest acting that she ever had to do because she just had to do it by herself and she had to use her whole imagination. And that's just what it was. And I remember thinking when I read the script, oh, esto va a ser muy fácil. This is going to be an easy job for me. It's going to be me by myself. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I don't have to wait for anybody. I get to show up, do my thing, couple of takes, go home. And it was so exhausting to kind of stay at this level of adrenaline of like your life is over, you have to save the planet, you're in a life and death situation the whole entire time that at the end of the day I would just be so exhausted, not just emotionally but physically, like 
from just like tensing up my body and throwing myself this way and that way and doing all these things and trying to concentrate and seeing things that weren't there and all these kinds of stuff. So yeah, I would walk home every day with what, what I would call the tired limp, which is, you know, you're limping. Usually you limp because you're hurt, but when you limp because you're tired, you're kind of like, like kind of like just a limp from being exhausted. That's how I walk to my trailer every single night. So. It was, it was, I feel it so was bad right now. It was. It was exhausting, but it was also exhilarating in a lot of ways because it was a new type of thing that I had never done. See, well, I have a question for you. Um, this is my question. <laughs> I want to know not the differences, but the similarities in playing a doll and AI. Are there any? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can you can talk about the difference as well if you if you like. Well, one. But Tom is more cute. Yeah. Why do you have to be so cute? I don't bother Ken wanting one's to in the world. world. <laughs> one kind of surfs and does beach all day, and then <laughs> at night does a. Uh, we do we party and we have choreographed <laughs> dance sequences. So and, fun. And the other one is trying to <laughs> obliterate humanity. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of tough to find similarities, I guess. Um, um, no, because you're bringing to life both um, inanimate. Inanimate. Neither neither of them have genitals. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I found a similarity. Thank you. <laughs> you're a genius. No, it's como como dice genitals. Genitales. Genitales. Ninguno genitales. Ken y Harlan, no 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 tiene. No tiene. Genitales. Eh, sí, sí, se lo estaban preguntando. Ahora lo sabemos. Gracias. De nada. So, we got a question from Milenio here in Mexico, Rosa Solano. Um, Jennifer, in the film, your character distrusts artificial intelligence and has to work alongside it on a special mission. In real life, how much do you trust new technologies and how do you incorporate them into your daily activities? And I'm just going to go ahead and ask all of you guys the same question. Well, I, I zoned out because the question was for Jen. What was the question? <laughs> it's like, how do we use um, technology in our everyday lives and how do we embrace it? And if you guys trust new technologies and do we trust it? I'm, I'm not like a super technical guy, actually. I mean, everyone thinks like because I do lots of visual effects and explosions and stuff. I, I am, but, but I'm, I'm not. I'm actually more of like a pen, pencil and light board. Like, I come from animation, so. Do you talk to your devices? No. No, no I don't. I don't talk to my devices at all. So weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People, turn on the lights! No, it's kind of weird. Do you guys, do you guys use like, love it though. GPT for anything? No. I don't, I don't. Yeah. I, I started using ChatGPT to, um, come up with travel itineraries for me. Like if I'm going somewhere, I'll be like, uh, give me give me like a three day itinerary of Palermo, Italy, or like, you know, Mexico City, three days. What would I what would I do? And GPT will like tell you, you know, you can say you tell me where the best places to shop and all that. Yes, as long as it's before twenty twenty two or whatever GPT goes up to. But it will you can say this is where I'm staying, find me an itinerary where like I'm not bouncing around the city, like where everything kind of makes sense. Everything flips and it'll spit something out. Amazing. Yeah. Terrifying, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you do trust them? You I don't think I trust. Them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not like divulging my deepest, darkest secrets. But uh, I think I think we're on the precipice of like a, a, quite a quite a revolutionary uh, moment when it comes to AI. You know, I think we all I think we all feel it. I think a lot of us in the entertainment industry feel it. A lot of us in the arts feel it. And. Um, yeah, it's a, I, I think I think scary is a, is a is a great word, and I think it's it's imperative to me that we keep in mind humanity always comes first, and that decision making should always. I think Harlan is the perfect example of why AI should never be used for decision making. Um, um, we should never let algorithms and data be the decision making leaders. I mean, we should use those things to enhance and to, to yeah, as tools and to inform exactly. Um, but never to never to lead. Um, you know, I don't want to work in an industry where every single creative decision is made by data or an algorithm. I want these decisions to be made by passion and human emotion. You know, there's a filmmaker who loves to tell a story. This is the story they want to tell. Like that's the that's the movie that we should make. 
And um, and if it's and if the story is true and the emotionality is there and the character is good, then people will watch it. It's not a it's not a th those things can't be quantified by data. I had an interesting experience because I, I worked with a, a couple of futurists before we made the movie, and it was to do everything like talk about like weapon systems, propulsion systems, uh, ecology. Like I didn't want to show Los Angeles in the beginning of the movie like you see it like with Mad Max or something where it's all sand dunes. Like I wanted to try to figure out what what would really happen in probably about a hundred years, and that's why you see these giant arrays for solar power in our version of Los Angeles. And, and he had a really interesting thing that he said to me about AI, and it sort of was my true north for making the movie, and it was very much in line with what I wanted to do uh, intuitively, which was he said, AI is a tool. It's like a hammer. A, a hammer can do a lot of harm, and a hammer can do a lot of good. You know, like you could build a house with a hammer and save lives. And, and when he said that to me, I, I, I realized that's exactly what I want to do. I want to show that AI is something that's basically here today now, but it doesn't excuse us people from being responsible. We are responsible entities of it. It is a tool. We have to take ourselves in full responsibility of how we use it. And, and this movie shows that. It shows the full good of it and how humanity can grow and expand and go way beyond itself. And then it shows how nasty Simu can be and try to kill everybody. <laughs> Please don't kill us. <laughs> So we have another question from Argentina, eh, Magella Musso, 